Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you all had a good night's rest. And for those of you who have just come in uh, this morning, welcome uh, to our, uh, our 2015 National Patient Education Conference, which we're happy to kick off this morning with something that we uh, take very seriously at the uh, Scleroderma Foundation, and that is uh, this grand lecture on pulmonary arterial hypertension. The uh, foundation has been for many years on uh, the forefront to increase awareness about certainly scleroderma, but in, in addition, uh, the um, associated uh, conditions with the disease, one of the most serious of which is PAH. Together with our colleagues at the uh, Pulmonary Hypertension Association, we want to bring attention to this serious condition because while we have numerous medications to treat PAH, we still don't have a cure. That's why we're proud to offer this lecture this morning and why I'm honored to introduce our fanta a fantastic leader in the field, Dr. Lorinda Chung of Stanford University. Dr. Chung has devoted her career to the treatment and research of all aspects of systemic sclerosis with a special interest in the vascular aspects of the disease, including investigating uh, biomarkers and potential treatments for pulmonary arterial hypertension. So I first met Dr. Chung at an international conference on systemic sclerosis back in 2010, and I was immediately taken by her passion for patients as a practicing physician and also by the research she was involved with. And her reputation as a leader in the field continues to grow. In fact, um, among her impressive research pursuits, I'm proud to say that Dr. Chung is the principal investigator of one of the two major scleroderma collaborative research grants that we awarded this past year, which is the foundation's new initiative to foster collaboration between two or more scleroderma centers and researchers with the goal of advancing science at a quicker pace. So without further ado, I want to get started uh, on this great lecture and our great speaker, Lori Chung. Please uh, welcome her to the podium. Thanks, Lori. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, of course, I would like to thank Robert Riggs and the Scleroderma Foundation for inviting me to give this um, opening lecture today. So I'm going to be speaking about an update on connective tissue disease-associated pulmonary arterial hypertension. And here's just an overview of the topics I'll be covering. So first, I want to talk briefly about the classification of pulmonary hypertension the epidemiology, risk factors in connective tissue diseases, symptoms, screening recommendations, and then we'll talk briefly about diagnosis and monitoring, and finally, treatment and management. So regarding the classification of pulmonary hypertension, this has undergone multiple revisions over the past several years. And listed here is the most uh, updated clinical classification criteria for pulmonary hypertension. So you can see that uh, connective tissue disease, I'm not sure if this, uh, this laser pointer is working, but connective tissue disease associated pulmonary arterial hypertension is one of the major types of WHO group one PAH. So WHO group is uh, the World Health Organization. And there are multiple other groups listed here, um, WHO group one prime, one double prime, two, three, four, and five. And the significance of these different groups is that pulmonary hypertension can be related to multiple different mechanisms in patients with connective tissue diseases. Pulmonary ar arterial hypertension is thought to be the most common of these forms of pulmonary hypertension and basically involves the arteries in uh, the pulmonary arteries that are medium to small in size. Pulmonary veno-occlusive disease is a form of pulmonary hypertension that's more rare but can be seen in connective tissue diseases. And these patients often do not have a good response to vasodilator treatment. And the pathology involves actually the, the veins rather than the arteries. Pulmonary hypertension can also develop related to primary heart disease. So um, the major problem isn't starting in the lungs, but it's actually starting in the heart. Um, alternatively, interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis, which is very common in scleroderma patients, as you all know, 
can ultimately lead to pulmonary hypertension as well. And finally, uh, chronic thromboembolic disease is related to little blood clots that can form in the blood vessels, of the pulmonary blood vessels, that can also lead to high blood pressure in the lungs. So how frequent is PAH in connective tissue diseases? Well, um, in terms of the WHO group one classification, so all patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, about 15 to 30 percent of them will have an underlying associated connective tissue disease. And various connective tissue diseases can be associated with PAH, most commonly systemic sclerosis, systemic lupus erythematosus, mixed connective tissue disease. But other diseases such as the inflammatory myopathies, dermatomyositis, polymyositis, Sjogren syndrome, <laughs> rheumatoid arthritis, and even um, undifferentiated connective tissue disease has been reported to be associated with PAH. So <clears throat> here's the breakdown of, of connective tissue disease PAH. And as I mentioned, systemic sclerosis is responsible for the majority of patients with uh, connective tissue disease associated PAH. So on the uh, left hand side, your left hand side, or, I'm sorry, my left hand side, um, you can see a pie chart from a cohort of connective tissue disease PAH patients seen in the US from the reveal registry. And about uh, 65 to 70 percent of patients have uh, systemic sclerosis. Likewise, um, as you can see in the table on uh, your left-hand side, about 75% of patients in a UK cohort also have systemic sclerosis. So the next most common diseases are mixed connective tissue disease and lupus, followed by less commonly rheumatoid arthritis and the inflammatory myopathies. So in terms of the survival for patients with connective tissue disease, PAH, it's well known that these patients have a poorer survival than those patients with idiopathic PAH, where there is no underlying associated disease. So you can see uh, the top uh, few lines is comprised of patients with idiopathic PAH, congenital heart disease, and PAH related to drugs and toxins. The bottom two lines, the blue line, represents connective tissue disease, PAH, and the yellow line is portopulmonary hypertension. Sorry, I need some water. So when we look amongst the patients with connective tissue disease, PAH, the scleroderma patients tend to have the poorest survival of them all. So once you break down the connective tissue disease group, the scleroderma patients are the ones who do the poorest. Sorry, I'm going to lose my voice. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I hope I don't lose my voice. <laughs> so in terms of um, the prevalence of uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension in systemic sclerosis patients, it depends on the way you define pulmonary hypertension. So as I mentioned, there are multiple different mechanisms where these patients can get pulmonary hypertension. And an echocardiogram will give you an estimate of the pulmonary pressure. And so based on echocardiogram, almost up to a third of patients could be categorized as having pulmonary hypertension. But this includes patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, pulmonary hypertension related to heart disease, and pulmonary hypertension related to interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis. So as I'll mention many times <coughs> throughout this lecture, the right heart catheterization is the gold standard for diagnosing pulmonary arterial hypertension. And based on that, only about 8 to 12% of patients have PAH. So, as Robert already mentioned, PAH is an extremely important complication of systemic sclerosis. And the reason why is because it is now one of the major causes of death in patients with systemic sclerosis, despite the fact that we have so many medications to treat this. So previously, in the 1970s, this is a study done by Virginia Steen, 
uh, scleroderma renal crisis was the number one cause of death. But with the use of ACE inhibitors, scleroderma renal crisis, uh, patients are surviving longer. And now the number one causes of death are pulmonary fibrosis and pulmonary arterial hypertension. So we know that pH is a very important complication in patients with scleroderma and connective tissue diseases. So we want to be able to know what patients are at risk for this deadly complication. In scleroderma, this is pretty well studied, and we know that there are several clinical features that make us concerned that a patient is at higher risk for developing PAH. <coughs> so some of these, yes? <laughs> I think I just need a little more water. Thank you. It, it might, I might take you up on that in a little bit. <laughs> you, you are all prepared. I do have a little bit of dry mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So in terms of um, clinical risk factors, having long-standing disease, so you know, oftentimes patients feel, well, I've been stable for years, I don't need to get screened for pulmonary hypertension, I've had this disease forever, I'm fine. But actually, long-standing disease is a risk factor. So we really recommend continuing lifelong screening for PAH. Having an uh, older age at onset of your scleroderma is also a risk factor, as well as postmenopausal time period. And this may be just related to the fact that over time with age, the vascular damage that patients with scleroderma gets increases over time. Yes. So postmenopausal, you know, um, 50s, 60s. So uh, in terms of um, other vascular phenomenon, patients who have severe Raynaud's phenomenon, digital ulcers, digital gangrene, these patients are also at risk for having vascular disease in their lungs, just as they do in their hands. Those with a, a lot of cutaneous telangiectasias, <coughs> also a sign of vascular phenomenon has been shown to be associated with pH, and I'll go through some slides regarding that. Um, we look at pulmonary function tests as well as an e echocardiograms for risk for pH and scleroderma, and I'll go through a couple of slides describing some of the features on these tests that lead us to believe that patients are at higher risk for, for pH. So as I mentioned, um, Vascular disease affecting the digital vessels puts you at an increased risk for also having vascular disease affecting larger vessels such as the pulmonary or lung vessels. So shown here is a cross-section of a digital artery uh, from a patient with scleroderma. So the blue area um, is representative of scar tissue. And what you can see here is that um, where there should be one cell layer of um, in the center, on the inner layer of the blood vessel, you see this is basically replaced by blue scar tissue. And so where the arrow points, there's an opening that is about 10% of what it should be. This leads to decreased blood flow, decreased oxygen, and can lead to uh, ischemia or, or uh, <clears throat> death of the tissues in the fingers. So a similar process is going on in the larger blood vessels of the lungs in pulmonary arterial hypertension. Regarding telangiectasias, um, Ami Shah and her colleagues at Hopkins did a study where they literally counted all of the telangiectasias on their patients and came up with the telangiectasia score. And when they looked at correlations with the telangiectasia score, they found that the right ventricular systolic pressure correlated um, in a positive direction with the telangiectasia score. In addition, when they looked at patients who had right heart cath proven PAH, um, th those who had higher telangiectasia scores were much more likely to have PAH. So there was a 12-fold increased risk for having PAH with an increase in telangiectasia score by 10 points. Regarding pulmonary function tests, 
you've all heard of the diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide. This uh, basically measures the oxygen exchange in your bloodstream. And this can be a very useful test in telling physicians whether patients are at high risk for developing PAH. So in particular, having a DLCO of less than 60% predicted is thought to be concerning for PAH. And you can see this is a survival curve showing that those with a low DLCO are more likely to develop PAH over time. DLCO stands for diffusing capacity of carbon monoxide. So in particular, we look at the FVC to DLCO ratio, the force vital capacity over the diffusion capacity. And we literally divide the percent predicted FVC by the percent predicted DLCO, and you get a ratio. That ratio, if it's higher than 1.6, and even if it's higher than 1.8 in particular, we think that patients are at higher risk for developing pulmonary hypertension. So in other words, if your force vital capacity, which is how much you can breathe out, how much capacity your lungs have, if that's normal, but the exchange, the diffusion capacity, the exchange of oxygen is low, then you really get concerned about pulmonary arterial hypertension. So those tests are extremely useful on the pulmonary function test. Yes? There were supposed to be handouts, yeah. There, there should be handouts, yeah. I, I'm not sure when they'll be handing them out. They, I gave my slides weeks ago for them to make hands out. So yeah, there should be. Yeah. <laughs> so the echocardiogram is also an extremely important test that we do to assess for risk for pulmonary arterial hypertension in patients with scleroderma. Now you'll hear various um, cutoffs for the right ventricular systolic pressure that people would consider consistent with pulmonary hypertension. Um, however, there's a lot of variability in terms of reading these echocardiograms. So when people say a cutoff of greater than 40 is consistent with pulmonary hypertension, you really want to do a right heart catheterization to confirm that. Most patients who have a level greater than 47, the echo is pretty accurate in determining whether or not a patient has pulmonary hypertension. But between levels of 35 to 45, really the echo can overestimate the pressure or underestimate. So although we get a general sense of whether or not there's an elevated pressure in the lungs, the echo is not a confirmatory test. And again, the right heart cath needs to be done. But there are a few other things that you can see on an echo that can be helpful. So you can look for right heart enlargement. You can look for decreased function of the right heart so it's not pumping very well. You can look for fluid around the heart or pericardial effusion. And all of those give you a hint that this patient very likely could have pulmonary hypertension. Finally, it's important to look at serial changes in the echocardiogram, particularly the right ventricular systolic pressure. So if um, over time, on an annual basis, you do the echocardiogram and you notice that the patient has increasing pressure by two or three points per year, then you should definitely get concerned about developing PAH. So in addition to the studies that I've mentioned and the clinical risk factors that I've mentioned, we do uh, serum blood tests on all of our scleroderma patients to um, look for autoantibodies in their bloodstream. And these autoantibodies are extremely helpful in determining um, whether or not patients are at risk for various complications, one of them being pulmonary arterial hypertension. So there are various autoantibodies that are associated with an increased risk for developing PAH, including the anti-centromere antibody, the anti-U1 ribonucleoprotein antibody, or U1RNP antibody, as well as uh, looking at the pattern on the anti-nuclear antibody uh, test and seeing a nucleolar pattern. All of those are associated with an increased risk for PAH. 
Antiphospholipid antibodies also are increased uh, or are associated with an increased risk for PAH, and these antibodies are associated with um, clotting as well in patients with connective tissue diseases. And then finally, another test that you might be aware of is the anti-SCL70 antibody or the topoisomerase antibody. And actually, the absence of this antibody is associated with an increased risk for PAH. So in the other connective tissue diseases, the autoantibodies are less clear or less helpful in um, whether or not a patient's at increased risk for PAH. But in lupus, there's been some studies showing that, just like in scleroderma, antiphospholipid antibodies are associated with an increased risk for PAH. And there are three different uh, antiphospholipid antibodies that I've listed here. Other antibodies uh, called the anti-LA antibody and the anti-Smith antibody have also been associated with PAH in lupus patients. But because PAH is fairly rare in the other connective tissue diseases, we haven't yet determined other antibodies that are associated with PAH in these other connective tissue diseases. So now you know the risk factors that are associated with developing PAH. What symptoms should we be looking for as patients um, for telling us whether you should be concerned about PAH? One thing I would like to mention is that, first of all, symptoms are very nonspecific and can be related to things other than pH. There are a lot of things that can give you symptoms such as fatigue or weakness, decreased exercise tolerance that may not be pH. The second point I want to make is that by the time you develop symptoms related to pH, you probably have fairly progressive disease. That's why we think it's so important to screen patients for pH even prior to any symptoms developing. However, symptoms do help us in telling us, well, should I be screening them more frequently? Should I be sending them to right heart catheterization? So just to go through some of the other symptoms that you can develop in PAH, shortness of breath, of course, is one of the primary symptoms and something that um, should be assessed at every clinic visit. Uh, cough can develop, chest pain, dizziness, uh, presyncope or syncope, feeling dizzy and passing out. Definitely patients are very progressed in their PAH if they're passing out. Um, having lower extremity edema or bloating abdominal distension, and also very um, late in the disease, hemoptysis or coughing up blood is a symptom seen in pH that's very severe. On the bottom part of this table, Liz, the signs that we see on physical examination. I'm not going to go through that, but this is things that uh, your doctor should be looking for on physical exam. So one of the things that should be assessed at every clinical visit with patients with scleroderma is the WHO functional class or functional status. So assessing how much you're able to do. And basically the goal in treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension is try to get patients to class one or class two. So in class one, you essentially have no limitation of your usual physical activity. In class two, you have mild limitation of physical activity, but there's no discomfort at rest. In class three, there's marked limitation of physical activity, no discomfort at rest, but less than ordinary activity will give you symptoms. In functional class four, basically you're unable to perform any physical activity without signs of shortness of breath and symptoms. So, therefore, we come to what I think is the most important part of this talk, is discussing screening recommendations for pH and connective tissue diseases. So what should your doctors be doing for you when they see you in clinic in order to assess your risk for pH? So first I want to introduce the brain natriuretic peptides. These are cardiac hormones that are secreted in response to pressure or volume overload in the heart. So with pulmonary hypertension, with heart failure, these hormones are released into your blood and can be measured by blood tests. So these tests, there's two different tests, the brain natriuretic 
uh, peptide itself, or the N-terminal pro-BNP, which is the N-terminal part of the BNP. And both of these tests have been studied in scleroderma patients with pulmonary hypertension. So the NT pro BNP in particular has been studied more frequently in scleroderma patients with PAH. And basically levels correlate with not only the presence of PAH, so the high levels are associated with having an increased risk for developing PAH, but also associated with the severity. So the higher the level of the NT pro BNP, the more severe the PAH is. And now um, the NT pro BNP has been used actually as part of the screening tests to assess for risk for PAH in scleroderma patients. So just to show you that the NT pro BNP in particular might be related to scleroderma PAH in that it's much higher, these levels are much higher in patients with scleroderma associated PAH than patients with idiopathic disease. Likewise, when you look in patients with connective tissue diseases, the NT pro BNP and the BNP as well is much higher in scleroderma than in lupus, mixed connective tissue disease, or rheumatoid arthritis. So we think there might be something particular about scleroderma patients, why they release more of this hormone. Is it because the heart um, has some scar tissue? Is it because they have poorer heart function? Nonetheless, um, this seems to be a good marker for the severity of pH, in particular in scleroderma patients. So the DETECT al algorithm is a recently published uh, screening recommendation for patients with scleroderma that was developed um, in an international study using 466 patients with scleroderma who were at high risk for developing pH. And what was defined as high risk was that they had at least three years of disease and they already had a low diffusion capacity that I mentioned is considered a risk factor for pulmonary hypertension. So the diffusion capacity, or DLCO, was less than 60% predicted in all of these patients. And patients followed this algorithm, or physicians followed this algorithm, to determine whether or not to send patients on to right heart catheterization. And basically, 19% uh, of patients who were referred for right heart catheterization had confirmed PAH. And two-thirds of these patients had pretty early disease. So they had functional class one or functional class two symptoms. So either no or mild limitation in their functional status. Using this algorithm, 4% of patients with PAH were missed. So it doesn't get everybody, it doesn't correctly classify everybody, but it gets most patients. So here's a figure showing some of the features that are assessed in the DETECT algorithm. So in step one, uh, various clinical features are looked at, including echo, uh, I'm sorry, pulmonary function test parameters. So the FVC to DLCO ratio is assessed, and again, if it's greater than 1.6 to 1.8, then you get a certain number of points. Whether or not there are current or past telangiectasias, um, in my experience, most telangiectasias related to scleroderma don't go away, so I would say current telangiectasias. Um, whether or not patients have a positive anti-centromere antibody. Again, looking at that NT pro BNP level and seeing if it's elevated. Uh, serum uric acid, which is a blood test that is often elevated in gout, was found to be a potential predictor of pH in scleroderma patients. And then finally, looking at uh, changes of the right heart on the EKG. Looking at all of those features, you um, get points for each of the ones that are positive. And if the total points is greater than 300, you go on to do an echocardiogram. So that's step two. And at step two, you look for um, right atrial enlargement. So um, the upper part of the right side of the heart is enlarged. Um, and you also look for um, basically an elevated right ventricular systolic pressure. And if those um, findings are found, then you go on to refer to right heart catheterization. So this is a two-step process that many uh, physicians follow rather than getting echocardiograms on all patients. 
so this is just what we call a nomogram. So you basically add up the points from step one to determine if you go to step two, add up the points from step two to see if you go on to right heart catheterization. So I mentioned that the DETECT algorithm applies to patients who are already at high risk for pulmonary hypertension. So it might not be appropriate to use the DETECT algorithm on all patients. So um, in 2013, Dinesh Khanna, um, as well as myself and other uh, specialists speaking here at this meeting, we met and came up with general recommendations for screening and detection of connective tissue disease associated PAH. And there are several points that I think are very important. First of all, all patients with systemic sclerosis that um, is defined by your scleroderma expert should be screened for PAH. And we'll, we'll talk about what those screening tests include. Secondly, patients with other connective tissue diseases like mixed connective tissue disease or lupus, if they have scleroderma features, they too should be screened for pulmonary arterial hypertension. However, if a patient has mixed connective tissue disease, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, but no features of scleroderma, then they don't need to be screened for pH, just because it's so much less common in those patients. So in, in patients with scleroderma, though, you definitely need to do a right heart catheterization if any of the screening tests are positive. And again, we'll discuss what those screening tests are. Again, the second to last point to the bottom, um, right heart catheterization is mandatory for the diagnosis of PAH. So here lists what we do, we actually test for when we screen for PAH in scleroderma patients. I mentioned the pulmonary function tests are key, looking at the DLCO in particular to see if it's low. The transthoracic echocardiogram, looking at the right ventricular pressure, looking at the uh, right ventricular function, and looking for enlargement of the right side of the heart. And then the NT probiot P as well. As I mentioned many times, this is a very important blood test that can uh, be used as a screening test for pulmonary hypertension and scleroderma. And then finally, if patients do uh, meet the criteria for the DETECT algorithm with at least three years of disease duration and having a low DLCO already of less than 60%, then you can do the two-step process. In terms of how frequent we should be getting these tests, it's recommended that the transthoracic echocardiogram should be done on an annual basis. So once a year, whether or not patients have symptoms or not. So completely asymptomatic, you should still be getting your echo once a year, as well as your pulmonary function test. If patients develop new signs or symptoms that are concerning for pulmonary hypertension, the echo should be done more frequently. In addition, the pulmonary function test should also be done more frequently if there are signs or symptoms of, of pulmonary hypertension. So shortness of breath, increased fatigue, weakness, cough, chest pain, those sorts of symptoms we already talked about. Then you'll be getting the echo and PFTs even more frequently than once a year. And then finally, the NT probiot P as well. So we recommend getting it at baseline, and then any time there are new signs or symptoms that are concerning for PAH. So now that we've screened patients for pulmonary arterial hypertension, we need to diagnose and monitor the disease. So how do we diagnose PAH? Right heart catheterization. So from the right heart catheterization, you, we get different values, and I've just described a few here, um, but these are key values that can tell us whether or not patients have pulmonary arterial hypertension, pulmonary hypertension related to primarily heart disease, and pulmonary hypertension related to interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis. So the mean pulmonary artery pressure measures the pressure in the arteries from the heart to the lungs, and typically, the normal values are around 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. The pulmonary artery wedge pressure is the volume of blood the left heart has to push out to the body. And the normal value is around 4 to 12 millimeters of mercury. 
the cardiac index basically measures the strength of the heart. So it measures the amount of blood pumped by the heart per minute, and it's adjusted for your body size. Normal is around 2.5 to 4 liters per minute per meter squared. So the right heart catheterization, absolutely necessary in the diagnosis of PAH. But we do do some additional tests to, again, help us assess whether or not it's PAH versus some other form of pulmonary hypertension. So the high resolution CT scan of the chest is what we use as a gold standard to assess for interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis. And then ventilation perfusion scans is what we often do to look for the little blood clots that may lead to pulmonary hypertension or chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So going back again to the uh, classification of pulmonary hypertension, this is the three major WHO groups that uh, patients with connective tissue diseases fall into. So again, the right heart catheterization as well as the CT of the chest can help differentiate amongst these three different groups. So in terms of PAH, the mean pulmonary arterial pressure has to be at least 25 millimeters of mercury, and the pulmonary artery wedge pressure has to be less than 15. And there has to be no significant interstitial lung disease based on pulmonary function tests and high-res CT. In WHO group two, pulmonary hypertension related to heart disease, again, the mean PAP pressure is greater than 25, but this time the pulmonary artery wedge pressure is greater than 15. So that's kind of the differentiating uh, measurement between PAH and heart disease related pulmonary hypertension. In WHO group three, the uh, difference is basically made on high res CT and pulmonary function tests that show moderate to severe interstitial lung disease. Otherwise, again, to meet that diagnosis of pH, you have to have a mean PAP pressure of at least 25 millimeters of mercury. So I mentioned that we use the transthoracic echocardiogram for screening for PAH in, in scleroderma patients, but it's also very useful to monitor on at least every three-month basis to evaluate for uh, worsening of pulmonary hypertension or response to treatments. So again, I mentioned some of the parameters that the echo can, can provide, some useful information, includes the right ventricular systolic pressure, which you can measure to see if it's going down with treatment or if it's going up. Um, you can look for the right ventricular size and function, and you can look, again, for fluid around the heart or pericardial fusion, which is a marker of high risk of poor survival in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Finally, uh, there's a measurement called the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, or the TAPSI. And this is a fairly new measurement um, that estimates the function of the right ventricle. And so this measurement, um, it's not done at all um, echo uh, labs, so you may need to request this to be done. But at most scleroderma centers, we're measuring the TAPSI. And um, it's been shown that basically if, if your tricuspid um, annular plane does not move very much, so it excursion, the excursion is less than 1.7 centimeters, then you have an increased risk for death. So again, it just sort of measures how strong that right ventricle is and um, has been very helpful in determining prognosis for patients with PAH. Another test that's important to repeat um, on a regular basis in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension is the six-minute walk test. So there are a couple of uh, aspects that are important about the six-minute walk test. First of all, it measures the oxygen in the bloodstream, so you can determine whether or not a patient needs home oxygen. Um, important to remember that in scleroderma patients, you should use a forehead probe rather than a finger probe to measure the oxygen supply, since the ray nodes and poor blood supply to the fingers often interferes with a reading. Also, the six-minute walk test gives you a measurement of exercise tolerance. And we know that uh, the further you can walk, the better the exercise tolerance. That means the less severe the pulmonary arterial hypertension. 
So the six minute walk test is not specific to PAH and can be affected by multiple different problems in connective tissue disease patients, including anemia, lung disease, such as interstitial lung disease, even things like arthritis and muscle disease can impact the six minute walk test. So it's a little bit of a complicated test to interpret compared to patients who don't have connective tissue diseases. However, we know that if the six minute walk test is less than 300, that their disease is pretty severe. If it's greater than 400 meters, um, then they're doing pretty well in terms of the lung disease. So you just have to take these other factors into account. But if you follow a six minute walk test regularly in a patient without arthritis and muscle disease, it's pretty accurate even in scleroderma patients. Finally, um, one of the goals is to improve the six minute walk test. And it's been found that improving the six minute walk test by 33 meters seems to correlate well with symptoms. So um, if you improve that walk test, usually the patients are also feeling a lot better. So just like the echocardiogram we use for screening and monitoring of pH, the pulmonary function tests are also uh, repeated to routinely, routinely monitor for progressive lung disease. Now, um, I would say the echo, at least by pH experts, is performed more regularly once pulmonary hypertension is actually diagnosed than the PFTs. But I would uh, recommend that the PFTs also be continued to be monitored, especially in patients with scleroderma. One of the reasons is because scleroderma patients often can have concomitant interstitial lung disease. So as I mentioned, the force vital capacity can give us a sense of um, how much air or volume patients are able to blow out. And we know that this force vital capacity is correlated with the presence of interstitial lung disease. So when it's low, patients um, often have associated interstitial lung disease. And when it declines by at least 10% per year, we really get concerned that the interstitial lung disease is rapidly progressing and a high resolution CT scan should be repeated to assess for that. Again, the diffusing capacity, important in screening for pulmonary arterial hypertension, but also if it's declining by 15% per year, the lung disease um, is concerning, and whether or not that's interstitial lung disease or pulmonary arterial hypertension has to be assessed um, using high-res CT and potentially right heart catheterization. But certainly, the, the diffusing capacity is important to follow over time. In fact, if there's a decline greater than 10% in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, there's a higher risk for death. And if there's an improvement of at least 10%, those patients have better survival. Makes sense. A number of less than 39% predicted in scleroderma patients is associated with a high risk for death. So we showed this in the Pharaoh's Registry, which is a registry of um, early pulmonary arterial hypertension patients with scleroderma that are um, recruited in the United States. This um, registry was started by Virginia Steen and includes multiple uh, US investigators. And basically, all the investigators screen the patients for pulmonary arterial hypertension and then subsequently refer as early as possible for right heart catheterization and for treatment. So one of the predictors of poor survival that we found in this group of patients with early pulmonary arterial hypertension was having a low diffusion capacity of less than 39% predicted, very much associated with a poor survival. As I mentioned, the functional status is extremely important to monitor in patients once they've developed pulmonary arterial hypertension. And this should be assessed at every clinic visit. So our goal is to try and keep patients functional in functional class one and two with only mild limitation at the most. We know that those patients have a much better survival than if you're in functional class three or four. And in particular, if a patient is diagnosed with PAH already in the stage of functional class four, so having symptoms at rest, they're very likely to die soon after their diagnosis of PAH. 
So again, this is from the Pharaoh's Registry showing that the functional class four patients had the poorest survival um, uh, compared to those with better functional class. So other uh, tests that can be used to monitor pH and connective tissue disease, we talked about the NT proBNP and definitely higher levels associated with a higher risk for death. A couple of other um, studies that are kind of more research oriented are the cardiopulmonary exercise testing and the cardiac MRI. But these tests may be um, useful and over time we may be using them more to monitor pH and connective tissue disease patients. So finally, I wanted to talk about the predictors of mortality, again, in uh, the Pharaoh's group of patients. In addition to the functional class four and the very low diffusion capacity, older age at onset of your PAH, as well as male gender, are associated with increased risk of death in patients with scleroderma-associated PAH. And these um, features were again verified when we looked at another um, database of patients with connective tissue disease, PAH. This is called the Reveal Registry, again looking at U.S. patients only, but these patients are seen throughout the community and not necessarily screened for pulmonary arterial hypertension, unlike in the Pharaoh's group. So they're usually found later in their disease diagnosed with PAH at functional class three and four more frequently than in the earlier stages. But again, older males uh, and having worse functional class at baseline was associated with increased risk for death. A couple of other features that was found to be associated included having a low blood pressure on diagnosis, so a systolic blood pressure of less than 110. And then looking at various um, right heart catheterization features, including the right atrial pressure and a measure called the pulmonary vascular resistance. So just to emphasize the importance of the right heart catheterization in determining prognosis as well as diagnosis. So the final section of my talk will be on treatment and management of connective tissue disease, PAH. So in all patients who are diagnosed with PH, there are some general measures that, that uh, you should undergo and some supportive therapy. So exercise training, that's probably one of the biggest questions that patients will ask. You know, how much exercise can I do? And certainly um, there should be supervised exercise training. Walking is fine, but uh, pushing the limits where patients are symptomatic um, should not be done. You also want to avoid pregnancy. Uh, if you have PAH, you're at high risk for complications in pregnancy, both to the fetus as well as to the mother. Um, undergoing Im immunizations with influenza and pneumococcal vaccines is very important in patients with PAH. In addition, some other general measures, uh, diuretics, taking water pills to get the extra fluid off of your legs and um, out of your blood. Um, using oxygen if needed uh, to keep the oxygen saturation above 90, 92%. And then in other forms of pH, um, anticoagulants may be uh, recommended. So blood thinners may be recommended. This is less frequently used in patients with systemic sclerosis who might suffer from risks of stomach bleeding and things like that. So, um, I'm not going to mention the vasoreactive testing simply because this is not a test that we recommend for patients with scleroderma or connective tissue diseases, um, mostly because the majority of these patients are not vasoreactive, which means they're not going to respond to calcium channel blocker therapy alone. So we'll follow the, the white line here in the non-vasoreactive group. And we basically move, once you've been diagnosed with PAH from the general measures to FDA-approved PAH-specific medications. And as you can see, there's multiple medications that are now approved for the treatment of PAH and really have improved the survival of patients with PAH overall. So the prostacyclins are medications that open up the blood vessels, vasodilate, and they also inhibit uh, little clots from forming by inhibiting the platelets from clumping together. 
There are several different medications, uh, including IV epiprostanol, Treprostanol, which comes in various formulations, subcutaneous, IV, inhaled, and also oral. And Ilaprost, which is inhaled um, in the US, but there's an IV formulation approved in Europe. Then the rest are oral medications. So the endothelin receptor antagonists are oral medications that basically block the blood vessels from constricting or from closing down. And there are three different agents that are approved for that. Uh, Bosantin was the first one approved, um, and that's given twice daily, followed by ambrosentin, which is a once daily drug, and mesotentin is the most recently approved endothelin receptor antagonist, also given once daily. Phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors are oral medications that also open up the blood vessels. And uh, you may have been given these medications to help your ray nodes or digital ulcers, but they open up the blood vessels in the pulmonary um, vasculature as well as in the digital arteries. So the approved medications are sildenafil, um, which is given three times a day, and tadalafil, which is given once a day. And then finally, uh, a recently approved medication uh, is called Riosiguat, which is a soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator. And again, this leads to opening up of the blood vessels or vasodilation. Can you take the yeah, I'll go through that in just a minute. So important to realize that all of the medications can have potential side effects, and these should be expected. Um, but basically, you want to um, you know, measure the risk-benefit ratio. And if you're able to tolerate the full dose of these medications, that's best. But sometimes we do have to decrease doses related to side effects. So um, several of the medications can, can lead to GI side effects, flushing, headache. Um, in prostacyclins, you do have to worry about catheter infections if you're using the IV formulations. With uh, subcutaneous triprostanol, about 85% of patients will get an injection site reaction. Uh, the endothelin receptor antagonists cl uh, classically are associated with nasal congestion headache as well. And for Bosantin in particular, the liver function tests need to be checked every four weeks. In ambrosentin, um, this often leads to fluid retention or edema, so a side effect you should be aware of. Again, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, headache, flushing, worsened reflux, which is already a problem in patients with scleroderma, uh, muscle aches, and nosebleeds. And again, uh, riosiguat can be associated with similar symptoms, headache, stomach, upset, and edema. So um, just asked a question about whether or not these medications can be taken in combination. So yes, they can. Uh, typically, in those with less severe symptoms, we're starting monotherapy, or one drug at a time. But once they get to functional class three or four, where there are severe symptoms, combination therapy may even be started um, at initiation of PAH treatment. So we're assessing for clinical response, doing the echocardiogram, doing the pulmonary function test, doing the six-minute walk test, assessing functional class. And you can either sequentially add therapy for combination therapy, or you can start with initial comb combination therapy. And again, if there's inadequate response to medical therapy, there are some surgical options. So one would be um, atrial septos septostomy, which is not used very frequently, um, and more, than, uh, more commonly would be referral for lung transplantation. So lung transplantation is, is something that's still um, considered high risk in patients with connective tissue disease. But there are more and more studies showing that lung transplantation can be a very effective treatment for patients with end-stage PAH or interstitial lung disease associated with scleroderma and other connective tissue diseases. So being eligible to be listed for lung transplantation is based on a score called the lung allocation score, which is determined by various clinical features, your age, weight, whether you have other comorbidities like diabetes or kidney dysfunction. 
and of course the severity of your lung disease. So whether you require oxygen, and most patients are in functional class three or four and are already on IV prostacyclines plus a combination of oral medications. Really, really important to realize that uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease has to be controlled. And patients may even undergo a surgery called a Nissen surgery to improve their reflux before undergoing lung transplantation. Plantation. And the reason why is because reflux can lead to microaspiration into the transplanted lung and lead to problems. So the good news, though, is looking overall at patients with scleroderma-associated PAH compared to those with idiopathic disease undergoing lung transplantation, there's similar post-transplant survival. So I think that lung transplantation, there really is hope that um, you can do well if the reflux is well controlled and you have uh, eligibility criteria. So my last couple slides, I just wanted to point out that with the new screening recommend recommendations that are being implemented, early detection and early treatment is leading to better survival in patients with scleroderma-associated PAH. So this is a small 16-patient study done in France showing that patients who had um, the general screening in the gray line for um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it, early uh, screening and detection and treatment of PAH shown in the gray line had much better survival than those patients who underwent routine standard treatments and basically their PAH was diagnosed later. Again, comparing the Pharaohs U.S. registry to the Reveal U.S. registry. Pharaohs, we have early detection, screening, and treatment. Reveal is more of the general norm um, diagnosis and, and detection. And the three-year survival is much better in the Pharaohs group, about 75% con compared to about 55% in the Reveal group. So finally, I already listed, we have many medications available for the treatment of PAH. And there's still a lot of research going on, a lot of potential new therapies on the horizon listed here. And many of these are in clinical trials for idiopathic pH as well as connective tissue disease pH at this time. So my final slide, I just want to summarize some important points from my talk. Uh, first of all, pH is common in patients with systemic sclerosis, affecting about 10%, according to right heart catheterization. And there are cer certain clinical features and autoantibodies that are associated with an increased risk. We now have novel screening recommendations uh, for the early detection of pH in scleroderma, which seems to be leading to improved survival in patients with pH in scleroderma. There are many effective pH-specific medications that are currently approved, but outcomes are still poor and therefore really important to continue to search for new treatments for this uh, complication of, of uh, scleroderma. So finally, wanted to thank uh, the Scleroderma Foundation, the Scleroderma Research Foundation, and all my collaborators at Stanford. Thank you.